Namaste and in La Catch and welcome to this episode of One World and New World. And I'm Zen Benefiel, your host. My guest this week is Roger Martin. Now, I met Roger several years ago as a participant on the Friendship Bench, which a good friend of ours, Dennis Bitaco, hosts every week, Thursday mornings. If you haven't explored it, I invite you to do so. It's a great gathering of people from around the world to talk about becoming better people. Now, and Roger. If, and if you're in the UK, it's 4.30 in the afternoon on a Thursday. There we go. All right. So inquiring into helpful questions that change lives is one of the things that Roger loves to do. He helps leaders and project professionals be at their best irrespective of circumstances. He's a co-founder of the Mindset Difference. He's in that they help leaders and teams to achieve their best. And also he is a podcast host of A Better Way. And the organization itself is a cross-sectoral network of leaders committed to improving services, building community, and creating a fairer society. Now there are some reflections for Roger that I noticed he's had, and this is gonna be exciting. And, and as a, an author on Substack and BizCast, uh, or BizCatalyst 360 as well, he's refresh, refreshingly different, really powerful, highly relevant, life-changing, and extremely enjoyable. And I found him to be extremely enjoyable. Roger, thanks for being here today. Thanks for having me and inviting me, Zen. It's a, a joy to be here. Been a long time coming too so in this exploration of self my guests i explore how they discovered their inner voice wisdom guide you know we we have different experiences at different times in our life some of us do anyway not everybody does and, and we're seeking i am seeking to help those who may have felt they're a bit crazy because they've had these kinds of experiences and had no one to talk to about them. So now there's a chance for reflection and, and being able to understand that, oh, I'm not the only one. And I hope that's a gift to our audience. So Roger, how did you first begin to understand that there was more to life than just the physical structures and, and the thinking about them? Um, well, I guess it uh, happened around uh, 2014, um, so 10 years ago. I had I'd had a difficult, I'd had quite a successful uh, career, but a very difficult personal life, and had suffered um, bouts of depression. Um, and whilst I'd been to various psychotherapies and counseling sessions and taken various antidepressants, it had partially worked, but it hadn't fully worked. So I get kept getting bouts of depression. Mm -hmm. And then quite by chance, my partner, Selena saw an advert for a meetup locally run by a local chap called Paul, who had been studying the work of Sydney Banks and the three principles which aimed to um, explain um, why we experience life as we do. His, his inquiry was, what are the principles that underpin all human experience? Mm. And I guess being the um, sort of chap I am, that spoke to me. It kind of you know like oh wow if i can get my head around that well yeah the curiosity would be peaked right it's like what's this about are, uh, are there principles and what might yeah, be exactly and so we went along to those meetings and they were weekly and my as you say my curiosity got peaked even more and i devoured several books and went on various courses and um just more deeply inquired into what is the nature of experience but you know whether it be bloody awful <laughs> you know you'd be at the pits of despair which i've been or whether it be blissful and joyous what is underpinning all of that right right and I that, that question if i may as a teen when i went through 
my experiences and awakening, I was told at that point, you know, beware, my life's going to be full of trials and tribulations. Just have faith and trust that, you know, everything will be there at its appointed time. And it turned out to be true. It didn't make the journey any less tumultuous. Yeah. It just made it easier to deal with, I think. Well, I think my reflection on it is that over the last 10 years is the nature of transformation means you step into an unknown. Yeah. And I think that I was certainly very reticent about that to begin with. Um, I think we all are, right? Yeah, well... Like, no, it, change, what? I, I'm happy uh, where I'm at. Or, well, at least I think I'm happy where I'm at. Life doesn't it was, you know, re necessarily reflect that, though. Yeah, absolutely. And it was, it was the last summer I had the insight around well this is the inspiration for the substack helpful questions change lives because my own experience had been that having that question why do i experience life as i do front of mind with no answers not no real answers to it but it acted as a guide rail it acted as a sort of focal point with which to take a fairly giant step into an unknown field and it felt comfortable having that question alongside me as i as i discovered more about the nature of my own experience and so my reflection last summer when i got we had a month off and i got pretty quiet in my head was well let's try and help others not so much zen in your that you describe what you're doing which is helping those that have had awakening experiences but i'm i sort of see myself earlier on in the in the process downstream a bit as it were with people who are thinking about can my life transform can it be different what would that entail and does the why do i experience life as i do question interest me too and so i'm sort of offering some of my own journey there to help those who are wondering about starting on a similar one themselves now, as, do you think that in the process of the pandemic you know when it first began we went on lockdown here and i had this sense of okay there's a new beginning happening there's a door opening and i told my wife <clears throat> st petersburg russia initially i grew up in the ussr before she came here i said to her you know i really hope that this obsession on self hygiene and sequestration will get people to turn inward and examine themselves and, and start asking those questions and it seems survey says anyway and from our own experience of, of accessing and finding the bench right yeah, then it started it during the pandemic there were multiple groups virtual groups that began to form in the next few months after that of people looking for each other that was my experience too the bench being one there are several others that i attend to um and it it yes i agree it was people reassessing looking at what they really value in life um and as you say looking within to to answer some of those questions rather than to somebody else to answer it for them and um yeah i think that's been i think i think that's set in in motion the change we're still seeing unfold that's how i see it i think I, still... absolutely and it will unfold for some time because we're just yeah. entering in we're like babes in the woods with this yeah right? some of us have had prep work you know mine i had 50 years of prep work to be ready for this and it's rather prophetic and i say that because there's references all over the place from calendars to spiritual texts to cultural legends and, and all of you know those kinds of things that this is a time of transition between the piscean and the aquarian age for one that's one reference piscean age being mostly patriarchal the aquarian age being a blend of masculine and feminine energies now and so there's a rise in, in understanding in, in that and then there's also references that there is a wave of change where there's this new understanding uh mind calendar right we're going into a new time where 
this understanding of our greater aspects is actually being uh, paid attention to. Been there for a long time. The Vedas actually 15,000 years ago held the information of this unit of consciousness and that we're all divine threads of it incarnate and according to that philosophy, capable of becoming God conscious. Now, yep. to a lot of folks, that's blasphemous. Yep. Why? Why do you think that is? Um, I'm just working off the top of my head here, but it's probably, <laughs> it's probably inscribed in scriptures somewhere that... Um, isn't there something about we're made in the image of God so that mm -hmm. there... That, there is therein lies a separation them, not singular is yeah. what the original reference was sorry i don't understand say that again it was then so there's a plural in the original genesis it was referred to we were made in their image okay so that was kind of interesting not, not his image or her image or its image <laughs> right yeah right so this gives us that that okay there's more there, there's you know um and how do we at least open ourselves to the understanding or the possibility of it to where we're curious enough to let go of the shore and hop into that relationship and navigate the ocean of emotion to find safe harbor in a new understanding of that connectivity yeah which, which is uh non-dualistic in nature mm -hmm. when you're at higher levels of consciousness and not dualistic in nature when you're at lower levels of consciousness and you're only seeing black or white right or wrong either or the that's how I understand it. Who was together. it that said it's nothing is good or bad? It's our thinking that makes it so. so yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interesting pearl of wisdom, right? I often use um, the word well-being to describe an equilibrium of the mind where you're neither wrapped up in the past or the future, but you're totally open and curious in the present to what might be next. Mm-hmm and um there is a freedom from dualism in that state of consciousness which helps me and I, others that i speak to you know see see situations from multiple different angles and make new sense of things in a way you simply can't do if you're wedded to being right and somebody else having to be wrong or you you know you're wedded to good because something else is bad you know you don't you, you only tend towards one end of the polarity and you don't integrate right. you don't integrate both ends but speaking of the polarities do you find that <clears throat> when you hold a strong sentiment towards something as being bad or you're judging another person have you then later found yourself in a similar situation that kind of flips the table yeah i mean you're in I, that. i'll give you an example so i i would i would get as we all do get emotionally hijacked by something that we find abhorrent mm. um and um have a visceral reaction to to that um but the the, 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 I've come to the point where this has a truism for me. We're, we're only we're only ever experiencing our thinking, and that um, that leads me to a place where even when somebody's doing something abhorrent or has done something abhorrent, you get to a point where you think, well, if I were living in the thinking they were living in at the time, that could be me too. Mm -hmm. and it's that realization it's the there but for the grace of god go i idea right. that that makes me grateful uh for the fact i'm not in that position grateful that i'm i'm not as um 
you know, unhelpful thinking doesn't grip You're bound me. by the deviants. You're bound <laughs> by the deviants, good way of putting it. Um, but that takes that awakening, it takes that curiosity, it takes that wonder in order to not be hijacked by that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the work, I think. That's that's the work that a, if a terrorist did or a murderer did or so many people did, they could see perhaps that the emotional hijack they're in at the point of um, committing a crime um, needn't be the only one available to them. And if that realization were to be present for them, there's a high probability that they are unlikely to commit the crime that so many of us find abhorrent. Sure. Well, do you find that um, I'll just put it simply that we really seek to love and be loved and that the fear of not having that often provokes this these aberrant behaviors? Yeah. Ultimately, you're right. I remember I remember I talking to Andy Scarantino about this and she was saying she wrote a piece on LinkedIn, uh, which is connected to a war that's going on in the world right now. And she ended the piece saying, uh, we know what the answer is. It is to look within and find love. And uh, that stuck with me, moved me profoundly, actually, those words. And uh, um, yeah, you know, we can find ways through when it's present in a way we can't when it's absent. Sure. And do you find that you know it's really a challenge to and this goes back to the question as to why we can't accept that we are capable of god consciousness which is that unification of love both inner and outer right yeah. the half inside half outside and, and these conversations that we're that i'm having now is about the inner which most of us are bereft of distilling anything from because we get hijacked and we can't we fight the illness. So how do you think, and I may have lost the question I had originally, but how do you think that we are able to understand quieting the mind a bit more and to be able to do so? Because it, it, my understanding, it seems maybe you can reflect on this as well, that it's not about stopping the mind it's about and the thoughts it's just about becoming aware of them as an observer yes, that's how i would put it too i uh, the observer observing the observed it's the um i'm not a i, I was counseled in doing positive thinking at one time mm. and i and i found that somewhat difficult to do in some circumstances because if my inner experience was in turmoil and i was you know feeling quite despairing it felt like a form of self-denial to just overlay on top inauthentic of that. yeah it felt inauthentic and and it didn't deal it didn't really deal with the you know the hijack i was in the emotional state i was in mm -hmm. And it's your point around observing that state arising because you can't control it. You, you can't stop it arising. It, I often say to people, you know, you can't choose goosebumps. You can't choose a knot in the stomach. You know, you right. can't choose sweaty palms. It just arises. It, it and, and the thoughts and feelings that come with it. So, so as you, as you suggest, I find the, the quietening of the mind comes from being with that, not having to fight it, not having to work against it, think positively through it, any of that stuff, but just being with it and noticing it arise, noticing its transience, because it is a transient state of mind that moves through us. Mm -hmm. um, and the more we can detach as it were I was, I was thinking you know 
get on a ceiling or on a tree and look down on ourselves, observe ourselves experiencing these sensations, thoughts and feelings from a, from a figurative distance. And being curious about it too. And being curious about it um, without overthinking it. I think that that's the... We're thinking period. You know, this is one of the yeah. things that occurred to me years ago, and I think quantum physics is backing it up now. We can't think our way through a system built on vibration. We have to feel our way through it. Exactly. Now, in doing that, quieting the mind, being able to observe the thoughts, and, and eventually, uh, did, did you find that as you began to observe them, that eventually they began to dissipate and you could choose thoughts that were more present yeah i have a i have a phrase that says um that often springs to mind when life gets a little tumultuous so you'll i'll notice it so i'll notice the knot in the stomach or the sweaty palms and um I now see that as a signal that I'm not thinking clearly about something. So it's a, it, I see it as a kind of warning sign. Hmm. And I will get into, um, so I won't necessarily take it so seriously. I'm not saying every time, sometimes, sometimes sure. I forget, sometimes I forget this stuff. Right? Well, yeah, we get caught up in the moment and it's like, oh, yeah. right. we're human. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but when I do remember, it's, oh, this is arising. So let's be with this. Let's see what will emerge as I just be with it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's like a, this phrase is, oh, well, if not this, then what? And um, I just find that helps me be with whatever's occurring. And... Um, and reminds me of its transience. And and it also acts as a reminder to me who'd been a uh, depression sufferer, that to dwell on it and to ruminate on it and to make it loom large in one's inner life is what caused the depression. Now that's what, because for me, depression was about descending down a ruminating hole to the point where all all other perspective was lost mm -hmm. um and completely inaccessible and the you know that that voice in my head that was uh, was very self-critical and very judgmental of me i was now refer to it as a flatmate that would follow me around every room and never get lost when i told it to <laughs> Uh, you know, it, it reminds me of, of the two of you, an angel and a devil on your shoulders, right? And, and they're both talking to you. It was interesting. At, after I had my experience at 18, I really was profoundly affected by it and wanted to criticize it and, and really un unpack it, look at all the different things, including the notion that, oh, my God, this could have been Satan appearing to me right, which is what the Christian philosophy is uh, of these beings that come from the light and, you know, they're not who they say they are and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So I was prompted to go to the university library and look up the word Satan. So I walk into the library, they've got these two, you know, massive volumes, A through M and, uh, or A through L and M through Z or something like that. But the things are like three or four inches thick. What I found was in the very first reference to the word, it referenced the Greek, Thetan, T-H-E-T-A-N, meaning means what? thinker. All uh, right. So we're all thinkers. Yeah. It's how we choose to think that makes the difference. And I particularly enjoyed the twist that the crafters of the scriptures put in there to create a fictitious enemy to battle and to be yeah. intercessors of instead of saying hey look you have the power within you just as many you know spiritual guides including christ had said mm -hmm. we've all got a direct connect use it you got to get quiet in order for that to emerge. And back to the feeling side of things, right? When you exhausted that thinking, 
in your rabbit hole and you reach the bottom, was there a sense or a feeling that then emerged in new thoughts? Yeah. That, okay. I was but trying it, to get at how to. Once you, once you really reach the it. bottom, once you reach the bottom, you either never want to come out and, and, and become suicidal or you, or you realize you're at the bottom and you know, there's only one way from there, which is up. Mm -hmm. uh, and that that manifests as a feeling it, it, you don't think your way out of that it just manifests as a oh, i can't carry on with this uh this thinking any longer so i'm gonna get out and i'm gonna go for a walk and i'm not gonna stand on my duvet for a fifth day in a row and you know i'm gonna um engage with people and uh, you know it's it emerges but you don't think your way out of it it just it just it just comes I mean, it's up. a choice to emerge you know it, it's that um recognition that okay that there's got to be something more the curiosity the willingness to let go yeah and be open to and then that emergence of that sense that as i said before validates quantum physics right the resonance the the harmonic of your frequency if you will shifts yeah. from one that is totally condensing into nothingness to emerging into a sense of isness of all yeah. and being connected to it and then did you notice that there were moments of serendipity and synchronicity that helped guide you along the way and and how did that affect things you mean when i was coming out of depression yeah, yeah there were moments or even going into that you didn't recognize until you got out and looked back well on the on the way out before i'd had my moment of awakening and and you know, started looking at the why do i experience life as a do question in more depth on the way out of a depression you 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 could become quite self-incriminating so, you know why on earth did you think all those days about this why have you spent the last 24 hours ruminating on this when oh, yeah. you know it, it, you're it's worried about thousand thoughts that we have right absolutely. most of them are self-deprecating at that yeah point. <laughs> absolutely i had a phd in self-criticism i tell you <laughs> and, and um so that was and 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 to take the point you raised which occurred to me when you were talking was that to just be with all of that and and um uh as you say let your let your let let it go is where the fear was because i would i would say to myself but well, if i let all this go who the hell am i mm -hmm. if i don't think in these patterns anymore given the upbringing I had, given where I grew up, given everything that's happened to me, if I do, to quote you, let that go, then who the hell am I? What then? <laughs> and that can appear as a terribly frightening question. Absolutely. Or an immensely curious one, mm -hmm. because it takes you into the, well, what could it be? If not this, it could be both. Because <laughs> right? then that curiosity is the fright of what am I going to find? Yeah, yeah, right. But I think to your point around people being more at ease with their inner life and having uh, experiences like you and I have had, the the journey to that does involve a letting go, and 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 was and recognizing that that can be fearful, as it was for me actually turned out to be unjustified you know the the letting go and um stepping into a much more curious frame of mind around you know why this emotion is occurring or why am i thinking about something in this way or why is you know why is this back pain or pain in the neck or headache or whatever it is what what's the what's the root of all of that becomes a sort of playful curious 
wonder wonderment you know it becomes mm -hmm. an enjoy uh, becomes life becomes more joyful because of that and um and and i now look back and realize that the fear of letting go wasn't justified however real it was at the time it seemed right. very real at the time and that's a great point to make is that our fears are unjustified most of the time you know yeah. like 89 percent of them never happen yeah and we prove to ourselves over time that they don't because our experience demonstrates it yeah now there's another fear though that i had a conversation with jesus one time and he um i, I was really you know overwhelmed by it to begin with that it would even happen in the first place so i was in a state of, of really deep humility and, and a sense of unworthiness to begin with but then he says to me that my fears were the same as his were and what i understood that to mean as i've mentioned with you before and i'll share here is that in that awakening i had as a teenager i was told that i am here to help facilitate a new world order of harmony among people and planet so mm -hmm. my greatest fear is of not being able to accomplish that to fulfill mm -hmm. my mission and so from the same um reference i think it is that's probably how jesus felt you know a tremendous fear of, of even though you know we don't know the full story we only have remnants of it however for a person to have gone through that and still maintained integrity with it mm. is just amazing uh, um ineffable when it comes to that that's a feeling right that you just it, it's that awe of how can somebody actually do that and i find like meeting you and discovering the bench and it's helped to edify this notion that yes there is a progression and all of the trials and tribulations that i've had have led to this wonderful network and development of relationships and conversations that actually matter and are worthy to share yeah that's exactly how my life is unfolding too i'm having very different conversations with people than i could ever have dreamt of 15 years ago i could never have had this conversation with you 15 years ago I, yeah. i'm hip that was the for me i wouldn't have i wouldn't have understood a word you were saying <laughs> many still don't trust me <laughs> oh, and i'm used to that you know for for years i went from being institutionalized because of what i was saying to actually you know 35 years later i had the opportunity to speak to the international association for near-death studies all right and that was in 2010 at their annual conference so huge shift in foundation at, at that point of actually having the listening instead of closed ears and yeah. then um, a few years later i had uh, started a tv show back in the 90s talking about having these kinds of conversations couldn't do, go to the depth that we do today because I was 30 years younger, right? And I hoped someday to have a, uh, to be worthy of an interview with either Jeffrey Mishlove or Bill Moyers, who were the, were the two icons that I wanted to emulate in my own interviewing style. Right. And so that was 1990, 2018 comes around and I get a voicemail from Jeffrey regarding something completely different i uh i manage a website called ufology press and it's kind of about ufos and paranormal kind of stuff and he reaches out to me and says hey i just did this voicemail um which is the only method that i had on there snake pipe actually is the plug-in for for those listening if you ever want to use that so i hear his voice i recognize it before he even introduces you know says his name and my heart just starts pit of pattering and he says, hey, I just did an um, interview with Jason Trajani about the Greys, and I think your audience would be interested in it. 
would you take a look and, and see if you could help promote it? And so I did, wrote a blog post, posted it, linked to the interview, and then I sent him a PDF copy of my big book, uh, which is called Stubbing My Toe on Purpose, a seminal view of consciousness, cosmology, and the congruence of science and spirituality. Three days later, I get an email back, hey, would you like to come talk about it? So that was in June, August, my wife and I drove up to Albuquerque, and we had three conversations, not just one. So this was like a huge validation for me. 28 years in the making. Yeah. So, and I say that not just to say, hey, look at me. I, I'm saying that to illustrate patience, perseverance, and persistence in what you're doing yeah. will eventually bring your passion and purpose to bear. Yeah. Now, how have you noticed in your upcoming, you mentioned that, you know, you've got the podcast, you've got the group that you're working with. How did you see that emerging and, and where might we be going collectively as a network, as well as a global civilization? Because there are layers and clusters and, and you know, ripples if you will of yeah. activity throughout them well i guess i'll come to the ripples but let me start with the more personal i think that one of the um changes i've noticed is that in myself is that when my head isn't as busy as it used to be mm. my capacity to listen to somebody is vastly increased and that's important because if you want to have a deeper conversation about these kinds of issues and you know why we are experiencing life as we do it's my euphemism for that that you you need it it's important to start with relevant language i think about it the language that the person you're speaking to is using rather than oh, absolutely. the language I know your you, audience yeah absolutely and uh and so I do, I do a lot of work with project teams in the construction sector, you know, which is a, a, a sector that's renowned for delivering late and overspent time and time again. So I, I, I love that. The, and, and I don't think you knew this, and pardon me for, you know, the tangentialism, I mean, we're all tangentialists, right? So <laughs> partnering, um, I did that for... 20 years in building road and bridge construction. I was the guy that stood in the middle of the room and helped build the stakeholder team to address their teamwork, as well as look at future issues based on the contracts and, and the two to five year usually time span of the contract or the, the project schedule and have issue resolution plans in place so that when those things happen, there was no work stoppage. Because as you know, that's ten to hundreds of thousands of dollars an hour. That's, that's, I didn't know we had that in common, but we do. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we work with leaders of project, the project directors who leaders and project directors and their teams mm -hmm. find a way of working together that, um, isn't all task 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 with no attention to the question of how they work together and how they feel about how they work together because exactly. because if you get to a point where people are enjoying each other's company and the inevitable with so many moving parts on a project you're always going to get problems crop up but if they crop up as you know interesting puzzles to solve because we're together on this right. rather than they show up as you know um another pain in the butt because so-and-so hasn't done what they bloody well should have done sure sure then, now, i use a couple of terms i think you'll love and may be able to incorporate um job arky is being one of them the job's the boss everybody wins and there's no ego without we go right I, I hadn't heard that, but yeah. I, I use that. I get weird looks when, when I say that, but I'm weird anyway. And, you know, it, it, those are triggers, right? Yeah. When you can 
open a mind simply by something that you say that gets them to go, huh? Yeah. The door opens. The similar one I've heard is there's no I in team. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's a traditional use. Yeah. Um, so, so we, we, yeah. So the work I do is help people, is helping people understand that, you know, we all go up and down emotionally. Um, we can get stuck there if we're working under pressured conditions, which like, like a project can induce. Right. Cause you want to control things. Absolutely. <laughs> and unless we understand that movement of from good mood to bad mood to look, you know, high to low. And how the thinking that we live in causes that helps cause those shifts. And it's transient and temporary. Uh, exactly. And if we've got an appreciation of that, then the way we show up to the challenges we face, the challenges don't change, but the way we show up to them changes. Then that's the key point. Yeah. And that's, so that's the work I do. Um, and. So how it, does this inner development affect that what do you notice as some core shifts in how your understanding of self affects the understanding of others well we we do a session on our workshop about what we call separate realities which is you know once you see that you're creating your own reality through the sensations and thoughts and feelings you're paying attention to in consciousness about what's going on out there rather than fall into the trap we all can fall into which is we believe what's going out out there is causing what's going on in here rather than the the internal Paradigm shift to the reverse yeah. once that beds in and people what we say realize that for themselves so we, we run a sort of retreat like workshop over four days where over the first two days we we say to people we're going to slow down you know and it may feel very odd for you it might feel very strange for you, but there's a method to our madness, which is we can't see afresh. We can't see something new. We can't, we're not open to insight when our brains are running at 50,000 miles an hour. Mm -hmm. So the, so, so we slow it down, deliberately slow it down. And then people start to see, you know, like I saw, you know, that I was, I'd been caught up in stuff with my inner voice constantly nagging at me for years and years and years. And when you do observe that, you see that, then one of the, one of the, the changes that occurs in people is that they realize that they not only are they creating their own reality, but so is everybody else in the team doing the same. So you then, you, uh, their shift normally occurs then from rather than trying to cajole or persuade or win a case to get everyone to think the way you think you you move to a place of let's understand the realities we are all in on issue x first before we let a new solution emerge so that we don't have to you know argue against one another for right. my solution we acknowledge and then elevate you acknowledge and uh, it'll be a nice way of summarizing it uh, and doing that from the from the understanding that we can all elevate uh when we're in an elevated position and we might need to c show compassion and empathy for somebody who's who's not in a good place who are in a fearful worried place and give them space to share what they're worried about share what they're fe fearing because often that's what will block the progress. So if you can right. solve, if you can solve for that, well, it's the communication. Then you you make progress at a much much faster rate. Absolutely, and, and you know it brings to mind something that Wilbert Smith said. Uh, Wilbert ran the. I'm going to drop off the planet again. I go back to the moon, and, and so to speak. So Wilbert Smith ran Canada's UFO investigation program, much like the U.S.'s Project Blue Book in the right. 1950s and he had conversations with people from elsewhere is what he called them one of the things they said is that their perception of time is a measurement in the change of entropy so plugging that back into what you were just saying 
time to completion, you know, schedules can be truncated when things are in harmony because everything's flowing. It's when it's yeah. not that schedules are pushed out. Yeah. So by reaching this, there's a tremendous, and, and what you're seeing works not only for project teams, it works for relationships, it works for yeah. pretty much everything in life that you slow down, take things in, and then like, um, I think it's Redfield's book, The Celestine Prophecy, the third insight is allow that voice to come from within you and, and don't think things, right, or, or want to prescribe or project. Just wait until you're prompted from deep within you to speak. Yeah. And that's a tough one. It, it 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 is but your question was around what change do i see people making and these are the changes i see people making so you know planning something through and really you know getting where everyone's coming from and letting as you say something emerge something a way forward and uh, emerge it speaks to what's in the minds of that group at that time in that place that sort of planning work is often considered a talking shop or a nonsense or a waste of time or you know we just get let's get building let's get the shovels in the ground let's get started right right same thing with but, training development corporate life you know that's one of the last things that's addressed yeah one of the first things to go when budgets are cut yeah <laughs> yeah so so what we see is teams taking a much more rounded approach to the challenges that they face. That's much more cognizant of the separate realities everyone is living from. Mm -hmm. And of course that, that has two effects, I think, which, can, uh, you know, to take your point about rippling out on a wider scale, I think it, it means that one, there's a, there's a, um, a useful, what would you call it skepticism discernment about authority about you know relying on one authority mm -hmm. for a way forward whether that's a senior project director or a you know um, a prime minister or, or you know a head of state or whatever it might be so there's a discernment about that you know have have those in authority um our best interests at heart or can they see what's can they see what's needed in these circumstances as clearly as we ourselves sure. can? Are they an alpha or are they a servant leader? Right. Yeah. It's one of the new terms that's come up in the last few years is servant leadership. Been there for a long time for for some, right? Because there are those who do understand the emotional intelligence it takes to get people, places, and things to move into better space. Right. It's a it's a facilitation process. Do you find that it is uh, a challenge to get folks to to really open up and, and discuss those core things, or how basically how deep can you go with those, or what do you find are the the deeper conversations that arise that are unexpected? Well, one of the conversations, what is the role of a leader in tomorrow, in today's world? Because if you look at the models we have of leadership, going back to the tribes, going back to, um, you know, divine, divinely given leadership, of, of leadership of churches and religions and so on, and you come into the, you know, the modern, you know, the captains of industry um, during the Industrial Revolution. I wrote about this in a recent... Uh, um post on my substack it, what you see and, and then through to servant leader and agile leadership is one that people are talking about at the moment humble right. leadership that's right what you what i see as a trend in the way we've collectively thought about leadership is that power is moving from it being focused around centralized around one or individual or a small cabal of individuals to it being distributed more widely to people on the front line who are interacting with customers or, you know. Um, so the hierarchy is shifting from the, the alpha male at the top of the pyramid, 
right in competition with other silos yeah basically. and it's becoming more of a collaborative almost chaotic system kind of like d hawk when he started visa where there was no leadership there was just a bunch of people with skills and things to do and they all chose how to do them collectively to meet the mission and vision that that's the transition we're in i think because in, a, in because the pace of techno technological change is such a, such a pace mm. that no one individual can can know that the nuances in shifts in clients perceptions or employees right. feelings or and, and all like of that perfect place to, to for the collectively to recognize yeah. the collective to recognize okay we've got to slow down because there's so much here every one of us picks up a piece of it so we need to share those pieces so that we can create a whole exactly right and and, and what that means for the way leaders think about their role is a shift from I'm not the one who has to do all the sense making, choice making, and action taking, but I'm the one that needs to create the conditions in which many others throughout my organizations can do good sense making, choice making, and action taking. And and that becomes that's a that's a shift I see people making is that I'm a facilitator, you know, I'm a, as a leader, I'm facilitating bringing out the potential and the talent of others to make good sense of what's going on, to make good choices around what to do, and then to, and then to make it happen, to actually get the action done. And you want that widespread and, you know, the, those three things of tightly coupled so that that's happening on a regular basis. Right. So that's, the, it creates award-winning projects eventually. I mean, that's the result. I know for me, we've got a Marvin M. Black Award here in the States, and several of my projects achieved that because of the way that we organized the planning and strategy of how they were going to work. Yeah. And, and there's been a very good book written written recently by a Danish professor called Professor Bent Flievberg. I think is how you pronounce it, but he's a professor at Oxford University and he wrote a book um, called How to Get Big Things Built. I think it's called, I think that was the title of it. I might be, might have got the title wrong, but it's an excellent book that points out the difference between projects that have gone exceedingly well in terms of being delivered on time and within budget compared to the something like eight, nine and a half out of 10 that are always late. Right, right, and, all, right. and always over budget and it is in this you know no hierarchy um people feeling a sense of belonging people's views counting in and and planning being seen as a really vital critical part so that when you come to delivery much of it so much of it has already been thought through in absolute detail the mm -hmm. delivery isn't flying by your seat of your pants you know it's it's a it's a real uh enactment of a clear coordinated set of activities right so um yeah so that's that's the world i i live in and i see it i see those trends in terms of leaders recasting their role um inviting more others more of us to step up to the leadership plate mm -hmm. to um get things done collectively in a way we were dependent on others to decide for us before right enabled by blockchain technology web 3.0 um you know a, a currency native to the internet that isn't uh, held up by banks who charge a lot of money to transfer it across right. the world yeah, that... conversation. You, you mentioned that it just it triggered a thought of me I had a conversation with a friend of mine we'd met at a world futures uh, society breakfast and he worked for ibm for a time and, and was in charge of a bunch of programmers and he was um very interesting you know in that he'd grown up in the telecom industry was brilliant and he said you know where things are going is into a micro economy 
And when you look at things right now, this was oh, probably 10 years ago, we had this discussion. And now when you look at things, you know, it's $20 or less. It's what most of the purchase prices are for things online. And here's that micro economy. And, and now we've got the cryptocurrency that, that's creeping in to try to, you know, and even the banks have gotten involved with that somehow because they see, okay, here's where things are going and how effectively can we level the playing field so that we all have an equitable stake in our future. We're at the foothills of that transition. And yes. I, it's about to be given a real boost forward this week, particularly in the United States, because the Security and Exchange Commission there is likely to legitimize big firms like BlackRock and um, Fidelity and ARK Invest and others mm. into being able to trade Bitcoin through an exchange traded fund. So this is a this would be the first time a cryptocurrency is being acknowledged by the authorities in the States. It's already happened in Canada and other bits of the world, but sure. as, 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 a, as much as, as, as a new as asset leaders in some things, we've been far behind in others. Yeah. But, but, but I, I was, I was thinking the other day then we've grown up in a time when we would normally, our normal expectation would be, that a dollar or a pound in my case, as time goes by, would buy you less and less. Mm -hmm. What you can spend a hundred bucks on now or a hundred pounds on now compared to 20 years ago, it's like chalk and cheese. It just doesn't go as far. Right. Now imagine living in a world where you get paid in a currency, where your expectation is the complete reverse of that. That your that that technology technology advances will bring the price of goods down because of um, uh, because we get more and more pro productive at producing it. Like you're going to have AIs producing products via code that they write. The cost of that production is going to be pretty small, right? Right. So if you've got prices coming down and hard money that appreciates in value over time, not depreciates in value over time. The psychological impact of growing up, expecting things to get cheaper and your money to go further is a mirror opposite of the world we grew up in. Oh yeah, it's a total to thinking about Andy now, cause she's pretty vocal about this. It's a total mind fuck. Yes, <laughs> it, it does take, it does take it's taken me, I should say, I don't want to speak for everybody. <laughs> it's taken me a lot of hours of thinking about what this new world could look like. If we can freely connect like we're doing now, we're having a transatlantic video call that's costing next to zero. Mm -hmm. Um, We'll soon be able to transfer money anywhere in the world, exchange value anywhere in the world with no, you know, um, with no frictions in the way. So, uh, and that money could be one that, you know, we could reasonably expect to grow in value over time and, ha and help us be more wealthier than the expectation we have at the moment. Now that psychologically, for people's well-being, it's got to be massive, huh? <laughs> yes, it is. Now, and I don't, I, I don't want to worship money. Gosh, this is just, I am. Uh, there's so many places and tangents and things that we could go off on on just this discussion alone. However, I've got to bring it to a close. No, yeah. and in doing so, this is a great point to jump off with. What do you or what kind of advice would you give to those wrestling with these things that you just mentioned and the transcendence or integration of it what what can you recommend how to proceed on a daily basis well i i would say that uh to to it, as far as you're able to to be curious about 
why the status quo needn't be all there is so if you're if you're cons if life looks shitty if life looks difficult as it did for me for over 50 years it was it was i'm not saying that all of that was bad i'm not saying that at all far from it but i had some pretty big issues to deal with which i didn't deal with very well and and i got to a point of thinking well there's no hope there's no way out of this and there is so to just notice what your resistances are to notice the um automatic way we think that it'll never get any better and simply to get a little curious about that how right am i about that mm. um what if i was wrong about that what if there's something in that's wrong and that's right that we put together in a new way that makes makes things something new appear that you'd never thought about before so it's 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 that really is to not is to try and break free of the automaticity of the way we think about stuff that is problematic to us and to to use the curiosity that comes with that to um see whether something new shows up awesome roger this has just been an amazing conversation and what a way to end it with those suggestions uh, those were superlative um and thank you thank you Zen. i've really enjoyed it I really enjoyed our conversation thank you for inviting me it's uh, uh much appreciated my pleasure and see you on the bench soon see you on the bench soon namaste and in la catch and thank you for sticking with us for this episode of one world in a new world i'm your host zen benefiel and i will see you next time